if they will allow me. His truthfulness is satisfied in the cross of Jesus Christ. All of these attributes are fully and completely satisfied, but only at one point in human history. It can never be repeated again. It can't be repeated in Allah or in Buddha or, or any other person. And so when we attack him and his word, we are condemning ourselves. And therefore, he can't forgive us because of his righteousness. Only through Jesus Christ can these things be effected. And so that's the importance of the cross, is that we are facing our own moral dilemma. We don't change, I'm sorry, God doesn't change when we violate his standards. His standard is perfect justice. So when we violate his standard, and this isn't God, but this is an example of him, I am doing what is right. I'm on God's good side. God doesn't change like this. Okay, now God is angry at me. The Bible says God got angry, but it doesn't mean he got angry in the sense that we're seeing it. This is God's angry side. This is God's good side. All I do is because I violate his nature, I change in relation to him. He does not change in relation to me. The change is relational, not essential. Okay? So he never changes. We change. And that's why we as human beings can forgive. And we can say, well, I'm not going to hold it against you. That does not change God's infinite justice. He cannot forgive unless it is done on his terms. And those terms all have to be met together. You can't violate any one of his attributes and it be the God of creation. So there we go. Okay, um, Pat, I didn't mean to take so much time on one verse, but I, I want people to understand what... Really valuable. Okay. Thank you for being here. <laughs> all right, go ahead, Pat. I can't remember whether I read seven or not. I don't know. Gene knows. Five. Five. So I, I, I did that. Yeah, we already did that. Yeah. What, five? No, she didn't. She talked over your words. Uh, okay, I'll read it. Pharaoh's I'll heart, and I will get her. Thank you. Now, it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also, he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. Okay, 600 chariots alone is a lot. And that's only the choice chariots. That's like the royal guard plus all of his other chariots plus his royal chariot. So he's going out in full battle array against the people of God. Setting so. himself up for being... Oh, yeah. I, he, he really is. He's setting himself up with that. And you know what? Once again, God has demonstrated who he is. These people are without... A, a, an excuse because God has already demonstrated several years worth of complete sovereignty over the created order and not only over the created order but over the people themselves. Okay, go ahead. Uh, and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh the king of Egypt and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. Okay, so remember what they said last week and they repeat it again here is that the children of Israel are simply leaving it in boldness. They saw the Egyptians, they saw the devastation, and they said, we are being redeemed here. Now remember when it says that Pharaoh, the, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Was that active or was that passive? passive? It was passive. He did not actively harden Pharaoh's heart. He passively did it by saying that I am going to do these. It's the same thing. This is a good example of passive over active hardening. I am told in God's word that I I uh, am not to, what's one of the commandments? I'm not to bow down to idols, okay? All right, and I bow down to an idol. I am hardening my own heart to the word of the Lord, okay? But the Lord is passively hardening my heart because his word says, do not bow down to idols. He's not actively doing it. I am the active participant in bowing down to idols. He is passively doing it by saying, don't do this thing. He has given me his word, and so his hardening of my heart occurs passively on his part, actively on my part. Same thing here. He has already actively showed Pharaoh that he is in control. Have a great day, Dave. Thank you, so you see the difference. This is a passive act, uh, uh, action on God's part. He has told him already, these are my people, let my people go. And Pharaoh is the one that says, I am not going to listen. And so it is active on Pharaoh's part. All right. Can I ask a question? Yes. Totally unrelated. But to this. yeah, absolutely. 
has to do with music. Okay. This female voice keeps coming up in my head, a song that I think has the lyric, Harden My Heart. Uh, gonna harden my heart, gonna, uh, gonna, my tears. Hang on, um, I, I've got it. It was from the 80s. Um, I'm gonna harden my heart. Uh, wasn't it from the group Heart? Uh, no, it wasn't Heart, but it was, uh, uh, was it a girl singing? It was a girl singing. I'm gonna harden my heart, gonna, my fears. Oh, come on, Charlie. Okay. I will remember it before the end of this class. I'll think about it. Um, it was, but you're right, that's, that's, <laughs> it's not totally irrelevant. No, it, it, it's relevant to what we're talking about. I, I'm, I, I will remember who it is, and if I don't, I'm going to go home and I'm going to go right onto the YouTube and check it out, because it's a song that was popular when I was in high school, or maybe right after high school. Um, oh, it's right there. Let's get on with this. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Pat. Oh. All the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea besides P. Pahira before Baal's Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Okay, go ahead and read 11, and we'll see what they cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, <coughs> Because there were no graves in Egypt, why have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? <laughs> why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Okay, once again, this is the exact opposite of what we just saw with the Egyptians. The Egyptians are being knuckleheads because they know that God is in charge. These people are being knuckleheads because they are lacking faith in what they have seen. Clearly demonstrated. They're living in the land of Goshen. Not a cow dies. All of the other cows in Egypt die. They're living in the land of Goshen. It's total sunlight. And the rest of Egypt is completely in darkness that you can feel. And this went on for ten plagues. The Passover. They, all they, the question is, when they... And this is something that I was going to speak about next Sunday because we had a good discussion in here yesterday and I had to, actually during the sermon, I spent all my time thinking about what Ray asked a question and then Tasha got involved in it. And I, I actually had to sit during the sermon and figure this out so we could talk about it. But um, did the blood on the doorposts save them? Was that what saved them from... No. What was it that saved them? Obedience. Obedience. It was faith. By faith, they put that blood on the lintel and on the doorpost. God said put the blood up there, and it is not the blood that actually saved them. It is faith in the blood doing what occurred. All right? Throughout the Bible, it is faith that saves the human soul. That is it. God, there's nothing else we can give God. There's nothing we can make that will please Him. There's nothing that we can do. We can't go to Walmart or what's the store right down? Publix. I can't go to Publix and hand out tracts and make God any happier. That's not going to do any good unless I am doing it by faith. If I'm just going out there because this church says if you go out and you give out tracts, God is going to, uh, you know, blah, 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 and you think, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to go do it, and you have no faith in what you're doing, it's not pleasing to God. He made the tracks or the paper for the track. He did it, the, he, the people that are there are there because he made them. It is faith in what you are doing that pleases God. And so same thing here. These people have gone from a point of being completely faithful at the Passover to being completely unfaithful within a very short amount of time. I believe it's three days if we went through this. But they're down at the sea and literally they are crying out to the Lord saying, why did you do this? Right? Yeah, I mean, it's just unbelievable because it, it, how quickly we forget. And I got to tell you what, I do it all the time. I want everybody here to know that I do this all the time. We find, remember that chiasm we found in the Bible here just recently? God is showing us that he is honoring this Bible class by showing us something that nobody has seen in 3,500 years. The next day something happens, I think, Lord, you know, I just don't know. I, and I do it all the time. I do it all the time. Church on the beach. I, I, I hope there's going to be enough people to have a sermon tonight. You know, I mean, he's always provided people out there. 
I, always, even last night, you know, we got uh, one family that's moved. We've got three or four families that are out vacationing and people just show up. I mean, people I'd never seen before just show up. The Lord will provide. Why am I sitting there every Sunday afternoon twiddling my thumbs and thinking, gee whiz, you know, I, I hope there's more than two people, you know. A total lack of faith. So don't blame these people, but it shows you how corrupt we are in our own nature. God is demonstrating in our lives continuously. Every time we wake up and our eyes pop open, God has done it. Yeah. You know, I think I said this maybe in class yesterday. I might not have. Did I give the example of the guy that was in his uh, hover round going down Clark Road? He's going down Clark Road by that cow pasture on the way to, uh, on the way to uh, Walmart, right? I'm, I'm coming. What's that? Hover round. One of those little things old people drive around in because they can't get around. You know, and he's got a little flag on the back of him. He's going down. There's this big, long cow pasture over here. Yeah. And so I'm heading north, and then you get to Walmart. And, it's, and I just suddenly dawned on me in the back of my head, suppose there's a nail in the road right between me and him. And I hit that nail. It's going to pull me over. I'm going to kill that guy. Right? That's, that's just... But the Lord is completely in control of every single thing that happens to us. When it's our time to go, we're going, right? And I, I mean, it just dawned on me. I want to be careful because I see an old guy here. But if something is in the road that causes my tire to go flat, it doesn't matter how hard I pull, he's a goner, right? And that is the way life is. It is tenuous at best. Every single action we take, it's... And, Faith is all that we have, that God is going to deliver us. And he's not going to deliver us from death. Every one of us here, whether you know it or not, we're all going to die. Some of us sooner than others. You may come in next week and Charlie, he didn't make it to class today, right? I mean, we don't know. And so the only thing we can have is faith that at the end of this book, I promise to restore what you have lost all the way back at the beginning of creation. And this is how I'm going to do it. And that's what we're reading right now. It's this wonderful story of how he did it. And unfortunately, it also shows the unhappy story of people that don't want to accept his deliverance. And we're going to see the result of that in a small way here in just a couple more paragraphs. Go ahead. Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? Mm-hmm. Or it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And what were they doing when they were serving the Egyptians? Complaining. They were crying out to the Lord. They were, they were miserable. And God said, I have heard the cry of my people. He's talking to Moses in Gen, uh, Exodus 3. You are there going to deliver. Their cry has come up before me. So they even lied right here. They had completely forgotten that they were miserable where they were. But they were so unhappy with the, the immediate situation that now they're saying, well, we loved it where we were, right? And we do that. The, the, the old story that the grass is always greener. I can't wait to get this new house. And when you move in, it's got a crack in the wall. And, oh, gee, you know, I really loved my old house. Never mind that the roof was caving in. And we just forget. We just forget. So... And this is just an indictment on all of us. This is, this is, if this is God's word, he knows every one of us intimately, and he knows our own failings, and he's just demonstrating them in a larger context. Go ahead. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. Okay. This, this is just one of those wonderful verses in the Bible where the word salvation is the word Yeshua. It's the name of Jesus. Stand still and see the Jesus of the Lord. Okay? Now, they didn't understand what this was pointing to. But he is saying, don't be afraid. And I, I quoted this one at the funeral of a friend of mine. Their daughter, I, one of my very close friends from all the way back, I was his very first friend in Sarasota when he moved here in ninth grade. And their daughter, 26 years old, died couple years ago, and I quoted this particular verse. I said, these people were hemmed in by a sea, they were hemmed in on both sides by a great gorge, and they were hemmed in from the back by all of these angry Egyptians. And right now, you are facing that in your life. And this is, this is the only kind of comfort you can give somebody during a, a time like that in your life, is that you are facing 
this same situation in your own life. Everything is hemmed in around you and you can't see clearly because your beautiful daughter is lying in this casket here. But stand back and see the salvation of the Lord. He will deliver you from this anxiety. And you know, within a short amount of time, they had another anxiety that her son would be taken away from them. They all lived in the same house together. She had her own separate apartment, so it was a different house, but same property. 